you know, nobody asked me if I wanted to exist. Yeah, one day, boom, there you are. And you think to yourself, why am I here? Well, what do you think? Is there a reason we're here? Do our lives have any real significance? Well, that depends. On what? On whether or not God exists. Wait, hold on. Are you saying that my life has no significance because I don't believe in God? No, not at all. I'm saying that if God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what you believe. Our lives would have no objective meaning, value or purpose. Many atheists themselves recognize this. If atheism is true, life is absurd. Okay, and why do they think that? To begin with, if God does not exist, then the physical universe is all there is. Which means you and I are just accidental byproducts of nature. Right. So? That means we were not intentionally designed. So there's no purpose for us being here. Whoa. It gets worse. If God does not exist, there is no absolute standard of moral value. You've heard of Richard Dawkins, the atheist. He points out that in a materialistic universe, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. So you're saying atheists can't be good people? No, I'm not saying that. Many atheists live good lives. What I'm saying is, atheism fails to provide an objective basis for saying any particular action is good or evil. Oh, come on. After millions of years of socio-biological evolution, humans have developed a sense of morality. We all know it's good to feed a hungry child and bad to torture someone for fun. Of course we do. But that's precisely what atheism cannot explain. If there's no God, then what we consider right or wrong is nothing more than an accident of evolution or a human social convention. So what? I'm good with that. Really? Evolution implies survival of the fittest, not morality. And social convention means that racism, intolerance and cruelty are not really wrong. They just happen to be unpopular. Okay, so atheists need to come up with some objective standard for rights and wrongs. How about this? If an action leads to human flourishing, then we can say it's objectively good. And if it doesn't, it's objectively evil. But why think that human flourishing is good? Aren't you being species-centric? Why not refer instead to the flourishing of rats or cabbages? Well, uh... And who gets to decide what contributes to human flourishing? Hitler was convinced killing millions of Jews would promote human flourishing. And Margaret Sanger thought forcing poor people to be sterilized would lead to human flourishing. As Kai Nielsen points out, pure practical reason will not take you to morality. So if atheism is true, there is no legitimate basis for saying that behaving one way is worse than behaving any other way. So it really doesn't matter how you live your life. Your day-to-day -day choices are meaningless. That's depressing. So if there's no God, what happens when you die? Well, nothing. You simply cease to exist. Right. So one person lives a kind, generous, thoughtful life. Another lives a horrible, violent, selfish life. It doesn't matter. In both cases, the outcome is the same. Nothingness. So how can their life choices have any objective meaning? Well, it's certainly meaningful if I discover a cure for cancer or save a child's life. I agree completely. But atheism can't explain why. Scientists predict that eventually the whole universe and mankind with it will die out. So everything comes to nothing. That's why atheist Bertrand Russell says we must build our lives on the firm foundation of despair. No thanks. I'd rather live a happy life. You're not alone. Every atheist has to choose between being happy or being consistent. You can tell the whole world you're an atheist, but you can't really live like one. Okay, so you're a Christian. If your God did exist, how would that change anything? If Christianity is true, then each one of us is here for a reason. And life does not end at the grave. And God, he's the absolute standard of goodness. He knows you, he loves you, and he intentionally created you. 
So your life ultimately does have objective meaning, value and purpose. That means you can live a life that's both happy and consistent. Well, that doesn't prove Christianity is true. Agreed. I'm simply pointing out that for Christians, living a life that is both happy and consistent is possible. For atheists, it's not. So what are you going to choose? Good morning. Good morning. It's me. <laughs> if you are new to Capital City Christian Church this morning, or if this is your first time, let me begin by apologizing directly to you. I am not the regular guy. And that collective groan you probably just heard from the regular attendees around you was them realizing that it looks like I'm going to be up here this entire time, which unfortunately is true. When Doc Pattison, our senior minister, asked me, he told me he was going to be out of town this week, he asked me if I would consider giving the message today, I was very taken aback. I mean, no one's more surprised than I am that I'm up here right now, trust me. <laughs> but I said, I guess, uh, you know, I'd consider it as long as the topic of the day isn't too heavy or deep or anything like that. He said, okay, great. And I said, well, what is the topic? He said, we're going to be talking about the meaning of life. No, oh, okay. So I laughed and I said, well, you guys must be pretty desperate if that's the topic and you're asking me to give the message. He kind of paused for a second. He said, yeah, Jordan, we are pretty desperate. <laughs> okay, you didn't have to confirm it quite like that. But in my final plea, I said, well, what about John Sutphin? I mean, he's the executive pastor. He's been at the church longer than I've been alive and he preaches from time to time. Why not have him give this message? And Doc, he paused for a second. He said, well... I guess we're not that desperate. <laughs> is he in here? No, he never is. Okay. All right, good. Well, now that I've really set myself up for success or maybe failure, let's lay a couple of ground rules. All right, we all know I'm not a preacher, so this is not going to be a sermon. But like you guys, and as one of your elders, I need to hear a good word every now and then, so I'm going to take another page out of Doc's playbook, and I'm going to preach to myself and invite you guys to listen in. Okay, that way, as long, if I say anything that's offensive or over the line, you can know that that's directed at me and not quite at you guys. And uh, I am new at this, so I'm going to beg your grace. If I do say something that's inaccurate or unartful, as I undoubtedly will, we're going to acknowledge that that is completely on me. On the other hand, if I stumble upon sharing something that's helpful or edifying in some way, then we're going to give credit where credit is due, and we're going to acknowledge that that's completely him. Okay? And uh, finally, I do beg for that grace. And uh, I'm just going to ask that if, uh, if you guys can give me that grace, we'll try to get through this together. And if you will be attentive and well-behaved and everything, we'll see if we can't get you out of here maybe even a minute or two early like any good substitute would. Deal? <laughs> All right. Let's go to the, word, the Lord in prayer for just one second. God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to come together and to, to worship and to learn more about your word and to fellowship together. We don't want to take any of these opportunities for granted. We just ask now that the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts would be pleasing to you. In your name, your son's name, amen. All right, so why are we here? I don't mean why are we here at Capital City Christian Church this morning, although I guess that's maybe part of it. Why are we here on this planet at this particular point in time? I mean, none of us ever asked to be born at all, right? let alone be placed in this general geographic location at this particular point in history. Is there any meaning to it? Maybe you never thought about that. I mean, for some of us, life is so good and pleasant, why would we think about such things? But for others, these questions haunt us. Maybe you've experienced some tragedy in your life, or you suffer from chronic pain, or you've lost somebody that you deeply love, and you wonder how anything could justify experiencing that level of pain. Or maybe for others, your, your wondering is a little more specific. Does my life have meaning? Is there something that I'm supposed to do? Is there some thing for me to fulfill? Are we all just supposed to live until we die? Now, these are questions that a lot of us have wrestled with from time to time, right? But they really center around that bigger question of what is the meaning of life? But I think maybe the more interesting question, the more important one, is why do we ask these questions at all? Does life have to have meaning? 
I mean, some have theorized that it doesn't have to. It simply is what it is. It will be what it will be. Why frustrate ourselves trying to figure it out? But for most of us, that's just not enough, right? One author, a guy we're going to look at here in a little while, he said, we have a burning under our fingernails for meaning. And I would wager, even if these questions aren't bothering you right now, at some point, they will be. At some point, sooner or later, you'll be sitting at a funeral of a loved one and you'll ask yourself, or maybe you'll wonder for your kids, right? Or maybe they'll ask you and you won't have a great answer for the question, what is the meaning of life? Well, we're going to look at that question and related questions today. Would it make you feel any better to know that you aren't the only one who has wondered these things? As a matter of fact, if you've wrestled with these questions, you're in some very, very good company. Some of the wisest and brightest minds throughout history have wondered about these very same things. Unfortunately, they haven't all come to the most hopeful of conclusions. So what is the truth? Is there some overarching grand meaning to life? Is there a meaning to your life, to my life? Or was Shakespeare right when he wrote, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing? Now these are just lines from a play because Shakespeare was a playwright, right? They don't necessarily reflect his worldview on the matter. They more reflect the frustrations of his character Macbeth at the death of his beloved. And that's probably a frustration we can all identify with, right? Doesn't life seem at times so chaotic and disorderly? How could there be any meaning to it? Now this question doesn't bother me personally as much. I don't wonder if life is a tale told by an idiot as much as is, it a life, is life a tale lived by an idiot sometimes. But I guess that's a story for another day. But some of the uh, more modern philosophers have been even more pointed in their conclusions about the meaning of life. The guy they referenced in that video, Bertrand Russell. He was a philosopher, very well known. He, lived, he died about 50 years ago, and shortly before he passed away, he said this, There is darkness without, and when I die, there will be darkness within. There is no vastness nor splendor anywhere, only triviality for a moment, and then nothing. Wow. Pretty bleak. Harvard's uh, Jay Gould, who was an anthropologist and atheist himself, he was even more descriptive in his summation of the meaning of life or lack thereof. He said this, and hang with me, this is a long one, but he said, we are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because comets struck the earth and wiped out dinosaurs, thereby giving mammals a chance not otherwise available. So thank your lucky stars, in a literal sense, because the earth never literally froze entirely during an ice age, because a small and tenuous species, that's us, arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. In other words, life is a complete accident. And so he concludes further, we may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. Mm. Now this answer, he says, though superficially troubling, if not terrifying, is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively in the facts of nature. And listen to this. We must construct these answers for ourselves. From our own wisdom and ethical sense, there is no other way. So in other words, life is an accident, an accident of nature. And as such, there is no intrinsic meaning at bottom. But if you still wonder about that question, if you still feel like there should be some meaning, your only option is to create that meaning for yourself. Now, what I find most interesting about this, and this view is held by a whole lot of folks these days, but what I find so, reason, so interesting is that while on the one hand, they're willing to admit and face the dark truth that life has no intrinsic meaning, but on the other hand, they can't escape the fact that it seems like life should have meaning, right? We can't escape that burning under our fingernails for meaning. And so, if there is no intrinsic meaning, but we desire it, we are left with the only option of creating it for ourselves. But my question is, how's that working for us? How's that working for you? Have you tried creating meaning for yourself in your own life? How's it working for our culture? You know, over the last half of the 20th century and the first couple of decades of the 21st, we have embraced these notions. We have embraced the idea that to understand the world, all we have to do is look inside ourselves. And yet I think it's interesting to note that during that same period of time in our culture, rates of anxiety and depression and suicide have been on the steady increase. Are we just doing it wrong? Could we be looking in the wrong places, perhaps? 
Well, these guys, of course, weren't the first to wonder about all this either. King Solomon of ancient Israel wondered about these very same things. And luckily for us, he wrote down a lot of his thoughts in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure if you've spent any time there. We're going to do that a little bit this morning. Happens to be my favorite book of the Old Testament and really one of my favorite works of literature of all time. I mean, I think even if you're not a believer, you have to identify with the spirit of this book. It seems to me that in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is having what we would refer to today as an existential crisis. I mean, he's wondering what it's all about. Now, let's remember who Solomon was. He's uh, the king of Israel, the son of David, right? He is the richest man in the world, and we are told also the wisest. He's got money. He's got power. He's got the respect of other world leaders. He's got, as we're going to see here in a minute, women galore. I mean, this guy has it all. And yet, look at how he opens this book. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, that's Solomon, Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, how can someone who has seemingly everything that would give life meaning come to this conclusion? Well, I think therein lies the rub, right? He does have every available resource we would traditionally think would give life some satisfaction and some meaning, and still he's coming up dry. Now, in reaching this conclusion, Solomon was actually reaching the same conclusion as one of the other more modern philosopher, somebody you heard from just a little while ago, actually. Let's look at this side by side for a second. So Solomon, he says in Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Sound familiar? Something like, nothing really matters, anyone can see, nothing really matters, nothing really matters. To me. Freddie Mercury, Bohemian Rhapsody. Hmm? By the way, if you uh, enjoyed that reference that Steve was making earlier and that we're quoting here, and you really feel like we're speaking your langu- language with this one, well, we got something else that uh, is coming up here at the church here in a few weeks you might want to look at. Uh, we're having an AARP informational session <laughs> that you might want to look at. I'm so sorry. I said I was going to try not to say anything offensive. That's really directed at Steve, okay? That song is almost 50 years old, and so is Steve. He's rapidly approaching the big five up. So let's blame that on him. All right, so back to Solomon. He's wondering about the meaning of life, right? We've already established he's got every available resource to do, do so. He's got wisdom. He's got access to pleasure. He's got power. He's got money. So he's going to look at all these things, and he starts with wisdom, wisdom itself. That makes sense. He's the wisest man in the world. If understanding the meaning of life is simply a matter of looking to our own wisdom, then for Solomon, this should be a piece of cake. And yet, he quickly concludes that wisdom, for wisdom's own sake, provides no meaning at all. And oftentimes, with knowledge, only comes more pain. And he says, for much, with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And like the modern scientists and philosophers of our day reluctantly conclude, wisdom and knowledge alone don't provide any meaning at all. By themselves, they just serve to illuminate the emptiness. And so, he moves on to testing pleasure as a meaning of life. And certainly this appeals to us, right? If there is no afterlife, nothing beyond this, nothing else to live for, why wouldn't we just maximize pleasure as much as we can in the time that we have? Eat, drink, and be merry, right? For tomorrow, we die. And certainly, there's plenty of people in our culture who are testing this hypothesis. But few of them have the ability to test it quite like Solomon. Look at this. He says he tried cheering himself with much wine, and he built houses for himself, and he had servants and had luxuries of every kind. Uh, Elsewhere, we're told he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. There's a little note in here also that always cracks me up. It says he had men and women singers and a harem as well. It's just like a little note. Oh, yeah, I also had a harem. (laughs) I mean, my goodness. And yet... Uh, Well, I do want want to make a point here. Nowhere does it say that God endorsed this behavior by Solomon. In fact, way back in 1 Kings, it makes it very clear that God was displeased that Solomon had taken on all these wives and concubines and everything. But it appears that for purposes of this experiment, Solomon was given great latitude. And he himself maintains that through all this, his wisdom stayed with him. Somehow, he was given the ability to engage in very foolish behaviors, but retain the discernment to acknowledge their foolishness. And in the end, he concludes that that's exactly what it was, foolishness. In testing pleasure as a meaning of life, he denied himself nothing, and yet he says nothing was gained. At bottom, he couldn't find enough pleasure to satisfy that need in his soul. 
I had a similar experience to Solomon not too long ago. Not the, not the harem thing, nothing to do with that. Uh, but several years ago, I became consumed with honeycomb. Not honeycomb the cereal, but real honeycomb. Have you, haven't you ever seen it when they pull it out of the hive and it's all gooey and it's like dripping honey? Doesn't that look amazing? Well, I just had to have some. I saw it on TV or something, and I, would, I, I looked for some everywhere. Do they sell this anywhere? And finally, by some miracle, one day I'm in a store, I look up, and they are selling those wonderful squares of honeycomb. They look just like that. Like, oh my goodness, it's my lucky day. So I bought some, and I took it home that night, and I was planning to have it for my dessert after dinner. I was so excited. I mean, it had been months and months and months, and now, now I finally got it. But as luck would have it that day, I happened to get home from work a little bit early, and uh, earlier than usual, and my Meg, my wife, she was still working at the time and outside of the home, and she called and said she was going to have to work a couple hours late that evening, so I was on my own for dinner. So as dinner time approached, though, I was feeling pretty lazy. I really didn't feel like fixing anything, and I'm walking around the house. I keep walking by that honeycomb on the counter, and it's looking better and better. And I'm getting hungrier and hungrier. And I know this is not a good idea, but I start thinking, what if I just eat the honeycomb for dinner? It looks substantial. It looks like it should be pretty good. I knew that wasn't a good idea, so I tried to stave off temptation, but eventually I just couldn't take it anymore, and I cracked, and I said, I'm going to eat this honeycomb for dinner. So I sat down at the kitchen table, got the honeycomb out, got a big old spoon, and I plunged it in there, and I pulled an enormous bite out, and guys, oh, it looks so good. I popped it into my mouth, and I got to say, as good as advertised. I mean, this was awesome. Just the, the sweetness of the honey, the chewiness of the comb. At first, it was just amazing, but very quickly things began to change. And before I could even get my second bite, as that first bite was going down, coating my throat, and then my stomach, and then seemingly every blood vessel in my body, I entered what I can only non-professionally describe as some weird version of diabetic shock. I mean, every muscle in my body started shutting down one by one, everything except for my brain and my stomach, which continued churning and swirling for the next several hours. I mean, I was sick as a dog. A couple hours later, Meg comes home and she finds me in a stupor on the couch and she's like, what happened to you? Like I ate honeycomb for dinner. Never doing that again. Horrible decision. But what was the problem? There was nothing wrong with the honey or the comb, right? Honey's great when used in small doses to sweeten things and whatnot, but when you make it the main course, it leaves you unsatisfied and sick. And that's exactly what Solomon figured out with pleasure, right? Nothing wrong with pleasure. As human beings, we need pleasure. To be healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, it's good to experience pleasure on a regular basis. But when you make it the main goal of life, when it's the main dish, it ends up leaving you unsatisfied and sick. And so he concludes, pleasure also is meaningless. Next, he moves on to toil, or what we might call work, accomplishments. And he says he built big cities for himself, and he conquered lands, and he made all, did all this stuff to make his name great, right? We know he built the temple, but when he looked at all that his hands had built, he, was still, he says he was still unsatisfied. And all he could think about when he looked at that was, one of these days he's going to die, and he's going to have to leave that to somebody else. And who knew whether that person would appreciate what he had done or whether they might squander everything he had worked for. And so he concludes, I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to one who comes after me, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. So lastly, he tries riches or money as a meaning of life. He's the richest man in the world, so why not, right? His treasury throughout the course of his lifetime just continues to fill up, and he keeps looking to that money, getting richer and richer for satisfaction and fulfillment, and he's not finding it. And certainly we We understand this intuitively, right? Maybe some of us have experience with this. I mean, there's nothing wrong with money. We need money to get by in life. But if we rely on that for our security and our satisfaction and our self-worth, there ain't enough money in the world. And that's what Solomon ultimately concluded. Richest guy in the world, nobody had more money than him. And yet he concludes, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. So the guy who has it all, he's got all the wisdom, all the access to pleasure, all the power, all the money. He tests all those things, and he says at bottom, they were all meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So if our modern scientists and philosophers can't give us a satisfactory answer to the meaning of life, and even Solomon himself with all his wisdom and resources can't seem to find a satisfactory answer either, where else can we look? Well, there is one more place I want to take you. Unfortunately, it's a long way from the 
royal passages of Solomon's castles, and it's a long way from the safety and confines of the halls of academia and science. Got to take you to one of the darkest settings in human history, the Nazi concentration camp. Dr. Viktor Frankl is a name that Doc has referenced several times. He's a man that Doc has referenced several times throughout this series, and for good reason. He wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, one of the best-selling books of the 20th, 20th century, one of my very favorite books of all time. I highly suggest you read it. But Dr. Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist living in Vienna, Austria, before the start of World War II. And a couple years into the war, in 1942, he and his family were taken captive by the Nazis. And over the course of the next three years, they would spend uh, time in four different concentration camps, including the infamous Auschwitz and Dachau camps. And unfortunately, during the course of the war, Dr. Frankl would lose his mother, his father, his brother, and his wife all died at the hands of Nazis. Fortunately for humanity, though, Dr. Frankl would manage to survive. And he said that he made the decision at the start of the war, when he, when he was taken captive, he was going to do everything he possibly could to survive as a psychiatrist because he wanted to observe those dark times of humanity and see if he could wrestle any insights out of that as a psychiatrist and live to share some. And luckily he did. He shares a lot in his book. I can't, don't have time to get all, into all of them here, but one in particular, one little story I want to share with you. He says that as a doctor in the camp, other prisoners would recognize that he was a psychiatrist and they'd come to him for advice a lot of times. And he tells a story about two people, two men who came to him on the same day separately, and both of them were contemplating suicide. And that was an all too common occurrence in those camps. If you didn't die directly at the hands of the Nazis or die from some sickness in the camp, many times you saw suicide as your only other way out. And so Dr. Frankel asked him, knowing the answer, right? But he asked them, why do you want to end your life? And each man separately replied to him the exact same reply. They both said, see, doctor, I have nothing to expect from my life anymore. That's certainly understandable given their situation, right? But this is where Dr. Frankel developed the question that would become the foundation of his therapeutic psychiatric practice from then on. He said, he asked both of them in return, what if instead... Isn't it considerable that perhaps life expects something from you? See, these guys had been looking at things as if once life has nothing left to offer, there's no reason for life anymore. But Dr. Frankel says by asking this question, by reframing their mind, if he could give them something outside themselves, attach their meaning to something beyond them, a person or something they had to do, he could give their lives just enough meaning, just enough hope to press on for one more day. I think this is a, a brilliant insight relevant to our discussion about the meaning of life. I think it's, there's a whole lot of truth in it. I think it is so close to the answer, so very close. What does life expect from us? I would change just one little word here from Dr. Frankel's question. What if instead of what does life expect from you, what if we ask what God, that God expects something from us? When I first heard, when I read Dr. Frankel's question a couple of weeks ago, preparing for this, I was struck by the similarities between that and one of the verses that Doc had already identified for our discussion today. A very famous verse out of Micah 6.8. It's known popularly as the Micah Mandate. Listen to the similarities. He says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. See, finding the answer to the meaning of life is not a matter of what life can give us. It's not even a matter of asking what we can get out of life. We simply, if we want to know the meaning of life, we simply have to look to God and ask, what does he require of us? So what about Solomon? Did he ever figure things out? Well, he went on for 12 chapters back in the book of Ecclesiastes, and then finally he reaches this conclusion. He says, now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So if it's true that God requires of something of us, if he has a duty for us to fill, then this changes everything. It explains why we have this longing for meaning inside of our hearts that nothing else can fill. It means that instead of Everything is meaningless. Nothing is meaningless. Instead of nothing really matters, everything really matters. Guys, if we want to discover the meaning of our life and life in general, we're not going to find it by looking inside ourselves. We can't construct it from our own wisdom. And we're never going to satisfy that longing by replacing it with some amount of money or power or pleasure or anything else. If we want to find the meaning of our life, we have only to submit it completely 
to God. That wonderful irony, right? He who would find his life must lose it. And then and only then do we get to experience the life that God has for us, what Jesus promised us in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full.